In 1960, Sheldon Glashow took the first step. Then Steven Weinberg and Abdul Salam expanded on his work in 1967. The mathematical model they developed is known as the electroweak theory. Their work was initially ignored because the theory did not yield testable results. However, slowly, enough experimental evidence did accumulate so that the three were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1979. The Nobel Prize is a distinguished award, but not definitive proof of a theory. There was more to be done. Weinberg himself knew what was needed to convince the skeptics among his peers. Uh, we have to do all sorts of things. So we have to discover the W and the Z boson, for example, which will be done in April in Geneva. Um, <laughs> Carlo Rubia, an experimental physicist, took on the job of finding the W and Z bosons, two new subatomic particles predicted by the electroweak theory. We're now in the countdown. In 1982, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics in Geneva, known as CERN, was the site of a spectacular collaboration involving hundreds of the world's top research physicists. The particle accelerator at CERN was built to accelerate beams of protons around its four-mile circumference almost to the speed of light and then smash them against a fixed target. The extreme heat or high-energy states which result from these collisions yield traces of subatomic particles which can be seen in no other way. First proton injection. The problem was, in order to find the W and the Z particles, Rubia and his colleagues knew they had to generate a collision that would create temperatures a hundred times higher than were currently possible. Second proton injection. Rather than smash the proton beams against a fixed target, Rubia's inspiration was to use the same accelerator to guide a second beam of negatively charged antiprotons in the opposite direction. You must give us the, uh, the last antiproton interlock condition, and the antiprotons are in. Since the proton and the antiproton have exactly the same mass and equal but opposite charges, the magnets of the accelerator can guide them in equal but opposite directions and accelerate them both nearly to the speed of light. two particles collide, if the impact is just right, they annihilate each other in a great explosion. Much of the energy of the explosion is converted into matter, creating new particles that fly apart, leaving mere traces of their fleeting existence. It's from the direction, velocity, and shape of these tracks that the particles themselves are deduced. This is a very spectacular in the center here. The experiment not only proved the existence of the W and Z particles, but showed that they had exactly the mass predicted by the electroweak theory. You know, it's high mass. Very high mass. The transverse energy is small. It's only 10 GV. In 1984, the Nobel Prize for Physics was shared this time by experimental physicist Carlo Rubia and CERN's senior engineer, Simon van der Meer. In physics, theory and experiment are intimately connected. Here, theory provoked experiment. Inspired by the electroweak theory, the CERN team figured out how to expand the limits of technology. They were able to create a high-energy collision, which allowed the two forces to display their common ancestry. Just long enough to confirm twofold unification. The internal consistency of the theory, combined with experimental verification, has led to an almost universal acceptance of the electroweak connection. But the goal is to unite all the forces. So the next step is to go beyond twofold unification to develop a theory which predicts that at even higher energies, there is a more distant monument, one which brings the strong force into the scheme and unites it with the weak and electromagnetic into a threefold link. It's unlikely any accelerator team of the future would be able to confirm such a theory. 
They would need a machine so powerful that with today's technology, it would have to be as large as the Earth itself. With dim prospects for such colossal machines, physicists may become ever more dependent on their theories alone. One important theoretical tool which is being used to unravel the link between forces and predict new particles is the concept of symmetry. Symmetry is a familiar idea from everyday life. We see it in nature and art. But in science, it has a slightly wider meaning. To best understand this, we must forget our preconceptions and embrace a new definition. A checkerboard remains a checkerboard even when the black and white squares are interchanged. This is the way to imagine symmetry in science. We transform a system in some way and it ends up looking the same. The symmetric ice crystal can be rotated. And although the frame is moved, the drawing still looks the same. Just like the checkerboard. This simple idea of symmetry has far-reaching results. To understand the whole universe, there must be laws which are true everywhere, on the moon, for example, and on Earth as well. That's a constraint on all theories. They must be symmetric between any two places. Einstein looked at the universe and imposed another symmetry. He required that the laws of nature be the same for an observer standing still as for someone moving at constant speed. This symmetry led to a revolution in thought and a new way of looking at space and time called special relativity. And out of this has come the famous formula E equals mc squared. But Einstein went one step further. He demanded that the laws of nature also be the same for an accelerating observer. He had recognized a new symmetry. He had seen how the effect of gravity on an object was indistinguishable from the effect of acceleration. This recognition enabled him to create one of the most beautiful scientific works of our time, Einstein's theory of general relativity, essentially the product of a simple idea of symmetry. But if there is as much symmetry in nature as physicists claim, why is it not more apparent? This can be understood by the principle of hidden symmetry. To see how symmetries can be hidden, let's think of an ordinary magnet. When we heat up the magnet to a very high temperature, it loses its magnetism and becomes a lump of metal. No north pole or south pole, uniform throughout. A tiny scientist living inside this lump of metal would see the individual magnetic particles as a random yet symmetrical arrangement. No matter how the magnet world was rotated, she would see the same pattern. To her, this is symmetry. But if we cool the magnet, its individual magnetic particles line up in a particular direction. The magnet chooses a north and south pole. Now, as our scientist surveys her domain, in one direction she sees the blue ends of the magnet particles. And when the magnet rotates, she sees the red end instead. Although in the cold magnet there seems to be more order, in fact, the magnet has lost the symmetry of rotation. The perfect symmetry that had been obvious at high temperatures is now hidden. The laws of physics haven't changed, even though the state of the magnet has. Physicists believe, as with the formation of the north and south poles in a magnet, that the four forces came into being as the universe cooled, hiding the perfect symmetry of the Big Bang. 